My name is Molly Anderson, and as Executive Director of the Nantucket Athenaeum, I'd like to welcome you to the fourth evening of this year's guest lecture series. Every year, the Athenaeum provides more than 800 educational and cultural programs year-round for our island. And inserted in tonight's program is a survey. If you have a moment, I would love you to fill it out and leave it with us or bring it to the Athenaeum, because we would love your feedback on future ideas for lectures. Although we're a public library, two-thirds of our funding comes from private donors. And an evening like tonight would not be possible without the generous gifts from the Geshe Foundation, NEH, and private donors like yourselves. And I'd like to thank all of you for that kind of support. <laughs> and now it's my pleasure to welcome Chuck Geshe, who will introduce our speakers. Thank you, Molly, for that very kind and welcoming introduction. But more importantly, I want to thank you in person here in front of the entire audience for the incredible job you do in setting up these lectures each year. And I'd like to ask that we all give Molly a very warm welcome. of this evening's speakers, Maureen Orth and Chuck Todd. Maureen Orth is an award-winning journalist, a special correspondent for Vanity Fair magazine, and the founder of the Marina Orth Foundation. She may ride a motorcycle, but I'm not sure. <laughs> That foundation promotes advanced learning in technology and English for over 2,000 students. Marie began her journalism career as the third female writer at Newsweek in 1972. Must have been a teenager. When she was the pop music writer, the entertainment and lifestyle editor wrote seven cover stories on such music icons as Bob Dylan, Stevie Wonder, and Bruce Springsteen. In the last two decades, Marina has traveled the world for Vanity Fair, reporting on a wide range of both heroes and rogues, such as Vladimir Putin, Putin uh, Margaret Thatcher, and Carl Bruno. From 1994 to 2006, she made headlines writing five investigative pieces on Michael Jackson. Her piece last year on Tom Cruise and Scientology was a bestseller and went viral on the internet. She received the National Magazine Award for the group coverage of the arts at Newsweek and the National Magazine Award nomination for her chronicle of the zigzagging career of Ariana Huffington. After first building her namesake public school, Escuela Marina North, in the 1960s as a Peace Corps volunteer, in 2005, Marine launched two nonprofit foundations. The Marina Orth Foundation in the United States and the Fundacion Marina Orth in Colombia. Um, Today, the foundation serves three schools in which every primary student has his or her own Earth laptop computer and receives intensive instruction in English and in leadership. The fourth school is about to be launched. The schools have been lauded internationally as model examples of public and private partnerships. Maureen is currently a trustee of the University of California at Berkeley Foundation, and she also serves on the board of interviews and is a producer of the Peace, right Peace Corps Postcards.com, an interactive website created for the 50th anniversary of the Peace Corps. Maureen received a BA in political science at Berkeley, Masters in Journalism and Documentary Film at UCLA. Marine lives in Washington, D.C. Her late husband, as I'm sure you all know, was Tim Russert, the Washington Bureau Chief of NBC News and moderator of Meet the Press. 
and most importantly for all of us, a dear friend of all of us who spend time in the Antarctic. Their son, Luke, is a correspondent for NBC News. Joining Maureen this evening is Chuck Todd. Chuck is the Chief White House Correspondent for NBC News, as well as the host of the Daily Rundown on MSNBC. He became NBC's political director in March 2007, and he also serves on NBC's on-air political analyst as uh, on-air political analyst for NBC Nightly News, The Today Show, Meet the Press, and MSNBC. Before entering the world of political reporting and analysis, Chuck earned practical political experience on initiative campaigns in the state of Florida and various national campaigns based out of Washington, D.C. While he was in college, he worked for the 1992 presidential campaign of Senator Tom Harkin of Iowa. From 92 until March 12, 2007, Chuck worked for the National Journal's The Hotline, where he was editor-in-chief for six years. As part of his position, he also co-hosted with John Curio the webcast series Hotline TV. He became a frequent guest on political discussion shows such as Hardball and Inside Politics. Tim Russert brought Chuck to NBC in March 2007, and he became NBC News political director at that time. As political director, he often provides on-air political analysis on political discussion shows on NBC, MSNBC, and blogs for MSNBC.com. He also does a weekly question and answer session with users at Newsvine. In December 2008, NBC announced that Chuck would succeed David Gregory as NBC News Chief White House Correspondent, partnering with Savannah Guthrie. He retained his title as NBC's political director and was also named contributing editor to Meet the Press. In January 2010, Chuck became co-host with Savannah Guthrie of the Daily Rundown on MSNBC. He was also the co-author with Sheldon Beweiser of How Barack Obama Won, a state-by-state -state guide to the historic 2008 presidential election. Chuck is an adjunct professor at John Hopkins University he attended George Washington University, majoring in political science. He received an honorary doctorate of humane letters and recognition for his work in journalism from Marymount University. He resides in Arlington, Virginia, with his wife, Christian, daughter, Margaret, and son, Harrison. Join me in welcoming this evening's speakers, Maureen Orr. Chuck and I are very happy to be here. This is my 20th summer in Nantucket, and um, I never thought any place could be as beautiful as California, but this comes close. Do I have the uniform? I got no socks. I want to make sure I have the right name back then. No socks. Anyway, so Chuck is an old friend. Um, he's one of the people I really respect because he comes from the print world first. And um, that's a joke. And, um, <laughs> it's and, <foolish. laughs> anyway, so we're just going to have a conversation tonight. We're, we're going to talk back and forth and kind of interrupt one another because we're just going to talk about how quickly the definitions of everything are changing in both journalism and politics. And um, we're going to interrupt each other and talk and talk. And then when we think you're getting restless, we're going to open up to questions. <laughs> so. And we're preaching from an altar, so whatever we say. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to start by, so as you heard, Maureen started at Newsweek, which meant she worked for the Grand Family. And as we all know, a massive change in the world of media. Uh, and it's a question I've been bugging her for two days. So I'm going to bug, it, bug her in front, of, in front of you guys, which is Jeff Bezos, founder uh, of Amazon.com, is suddenly your new owner. Are you nervous or excited? 
Well, I think I do both, actually. And um, obviously, it's nothing new that a, that a billionaire would buy a newspaper. And Willie Hurst is in the audience tonight. He knows that. Anyway, um, that's not new. But what is new is that if you look at the Washington Post in 2007, they had a profit of $50 million. In 2008, they had lost $250 million. And even if you take the economic recession, that's fairly stunning. And what has really happened and accelerated since 2008 is that the idea of a daily newspaper is no longer relevant. Nobody has to wait for the news anymore. News is no longer digested. It's often not even confirmed before it hits a screen somewhere. News is, is gotten on the internet, it's gotten on TV, on the internet, on your phone, um, in apps, on tablets, it's everywhere. And often the people who are reporting the news have no journalistic training whatsoever. They're tweeting from wherever something happens to be um, occurring. The news event itself may not even be that important because what is the news event? The news event is something that gives all the opinionators and the tweeters and all these other people a chance to express their opinion. And who writes the news anymore? It used to be that the very first authoritative um, um, version of a story was the one. But now when you have news being written mostly on the internet um, first or on some click of some screen, what happens is is that it can be endlessly refined and endlessly corrected and endlessly changed. And so the ownership of who has the story and what is real and what is true and what is not true, those rules are all by the boards. So if you are the owner of a daily newspaper and you no longer have to wait for the news to come to you, and even if you have a 6.30 newscast, if you're a major television network, you don't need an appointment anymore to, to find out what's going on. So why did the commands Why did the grants stop? Why did they do this? Why did they I think, you know, one of the things why I... Why did they do that to Well, you know, it, that's an interesting question, but the grants themselves are, are, are very much old school. They know their employees. We used to get handwritten notes from Hay Graham and Don Graham and people like... They knew their employees, and I think They've already had a whole series of painful cuts that they've gone through, and it really gets to the point where, are you just gonna say to people who've given their life to you for 40 years and still have a lot in them that they think that they can give and just say, you're no longer relevant? It's probably easier for an outsider to come in and fire them. Um, that's one thing. And then also, when you've got such a huge challenge, you really need somebody who really comes from a different place and is used to conceptualizing, I think, in a completely different way to see if he, if he can. It's a big question mark. Is he gonna be able to, what is, if a daily newspaper is no longer relevant, then, okay, so what is relevant? What do you choose to report about? What do you choose to um, actually put on the paper? when you've got all this other competition and you really, the news is no longer yours to report. Well, the other, the other interesting thing to me about uh, all this is the weird competition. You know, the, the question I think Bezos, he's doing this, he's got the money to burn, so he's willing to lose some money for a little while. And if you work at the Washington Post, if the grants are gonna sell to anybody, you're probably gonna leave. It's the way we felt at NBC. When G sold us a Comcast, we were worried we were going to get sold to a hedge fund and chopped up, chopped up into pieces, which is easily what the Grams could have done. They probably sold it for more money and watched the Washington Post chopped into pieces. And instead, Graham at least went out and found somebody who would be a sugar daddy. And I mean this in a good way, not trying to be disparaging, but somebody that sort of wants to solve the problem, right? Which is ultimately what's the problem. There's, we're, we're, Brokaw, Tom Brokaw has a very good way of, of describing this, of what's going on in the, in, the, in the news revolution, right? Which is, it's the Big Bang. The particles just haven't settled yet. We don't know where it's all going to settle. You know, we still think, and, and the problem is, and, and both Maureen and I are these minds, everybody in this room is going to be mostly of these minds, where you think of the news media, there's print, there's television, and 
and now we've added and gone ahead and said there's digital. We don't pretend there's radio anymore, right? Yeah. Radio. Oh, I love that. That looks that way. Um, but we, we still think in this bifurcated way. But I think what we're going to see is that there's this, this stuff's going to divvy up in weird, you know, there may not be three broadcast television channels that have news organizations. I think there's going to be one. I happen to, I think I work at the survival. I think I do work at the survival. Why? We've diversified ourselves. We're online. We've got a cable news channel. ABC is trying to survive. They're trying to start a news channel. And that's something that I would interrupt you to say that the other biggest, I'd say, the biggest media story of the summer after uh, the sale of the Washington Post was Nate Silver, some of you may have never heard of him, going from the New York Times to ESPN. Nate Silver, what is he, 30? Yeah, 30 years old, and he started out with sports statistics and, and looking at big data and probabilities. And he, uh, the New York Times, my friend Jill Abramson, who spoke here last year, um, hired him to work with the New York Times and start crunching the numbers for politics. And he was able to predict, and he predicted way before anybody else, that it was inevitable that Barack Obama would win a second term. And it turned out that he was so popular on the New York Times website that he was driving a huge amount of traffic. Oops. And, oh, okay. He was driving a huge amount of traffic to the New York Times website. Now, ESPN, which is owned by Disney, which also owns a, uh, ABC, just stole them away from the New York Times a couple of weeks ago. That was a huge story in media land. Because what is ABC and what is what are ESPN offering him? They're offering him a platform across. He can now work on, uh, work on predicting the Oscars. He can go back to sports, which is his first love. He can stay in politics. And there's all kinds of things that he can work on. And what his story is also proving is that so often now numbers are more important than words and the fact is if you look at the cutting edge of, of social media now and what kids are coming up with there are so many sites that are very hot right now that are just sites about images and and, and instagram and vine and we're almost getting to a point now where maybe we'd be sitting here in several years and saying, hey, maybe there aren't very many words around anymore, we're just going to see everything in pictures. We don't know, but that's really what's going on right now because it's changing so rapidly and it's very, very difficult for everybody to absorb everything that's going on and that too um, has certain consequences. When, when you have so much being blasted at you all at once, how do you determine what's important and what you should be paying attention to? And you've got an entire generation of people, young people coming up now who call themselves journalists, and they never get away from a click or a screen. Do they ever go out and interview anybody face to face? Do they actually even pick up the telephone and hear the tone of voice of what somebody's information is, which is the bread and butter of the kind of work I do? I don't think so. What do you think, Chuck? No, I mean, look, and the data revolution is also uh, cheap, because you can do it. It, it, is, it is cheap journalism, and I don't mean this. I'm not disparaging it. I think my mic went down a little bit. Uh, but it's not disparaging it, but it's cheap in that you can hire a guy there's all this data that's available, and it's not labor intensive. There's no expense account other than pizza uh, and coffee. And you're not sending them to hotels. You're not sending them around the world. Now this, and we want to get to a little bit of the unintended consequences of this. But this whole data level, and, and look, there's, we've got so much data out here. We can, you can tell some great stories with data. The interesting thing about Nate, uh, with what he does, is he, he popularized it. But at the same time, is Mike better now? There it is. It's coming back. At the same time, there are other people that are actually doing what people think that Nate does, but he's mm -hmm. not been doing yet. I don't mean this to disparage Nate. Nate's been very focused on the elections and then his boards and all this. There's some guys, that, uh, there's a guy named Richard, who is a bunch of academics that are taking, say, gun ownership rates and poverty rates, merging them together and seeing what kind of data you find, seeing if that then relates to. Um, crime waves in certain cities and you know, 
you're taking two, two different sets of data, merging them, and seeing what you get. It's basic trend stuff. People have been doing it uh, in the world of economics forever. And now it's becoming more popularized and more accepted uh, in the journalism. It's all, it's, it's good, it's interesting, it's different, but the concern, of course, that I think we're both saying is that what does it come at the expense of? Let's look at what they do, the prognostications on, on, on the probability rates. Probability rates in sports is great. At the end of the day, you know, that, that, that's fine. There's no societal downside to it. You start getting using probability rates to cover politics. And you can see how quickly that can, people worry that polls skew, co skew coverage. You start using probability, and it will skew coverage in a way that, that perhaps isn't necessarily good for the republic, number one. Number two, um, you know, it, it, it's, gonna, it's politics. It's going to be wrong. Upsets happen. Upsets happen in sports. It's fun. Upsets happen in politics, and it's hard to explain. you got to sometimes cover what's in front of you and cover the campaign that's in front of you to fully see it. And, the concern that, that we would, you know, we, Maureen and I have been talking, she goes, who's doing what David Broder is doing, right? Which Go door to door and knock on doors. He was the famous political reporter for the Washington Post, who for years, he was the dean of all the political reporters in Washington, D.C., and every election season, he would go door to door and different in Iowa and all the early uh, primary states, and he would knock on the door and actually talk to people. That hardly happens anymore. Now people just talk to the rental car person when they show up to the event. It's always important. And there's a, there's a couple of columns at the New York Times that even like, you know, I was on the Acela and I ran into this person you're thinking, buddy, <laughs> taxi you are not in the taxi driver. You're like, come on, go actually go out and talk to me. There is, a, there is a difference in that. But there is this, this is sort of this missing ingredient, of course, in the there, world of politics. And the other thing. You yeah. got to, you know, you got to sort of understand actually why people are believing what they're believing. Not just what, not just sort of how they'll probably end up voting based on uh, the magazines that they subscribe to, the guns, the number of guns that they own, and the zip code that they live in. Yes, that's a probability, but at the same time, why do they live there? Why do they own an extra gun? Why do they need it? That part of it, and that part of journalism is, is slipping away. The irony is, the campaigns are figuring that out, and they seem to care about it, but we we're losing that touch, and that's the concern about over data, getting oversubscribed and over addicted to the data portion of journalism. And one other thing I want to mention is this idea in, in the new form of journalism of keeping score. Because now, what you write or what you put up on the screen, it's a like, it's a favorite, it's an up or a down, and there really are, and there really are new, big new news organizations like Gawker that have a huge scoreboard in front of their newsroom, and everything that every one of their different writers writes, it goes up on the scoreboard, and they see how many hits they get on the internet, and they get paid according to the hits, okay? And that, keeping score like that, is becoming increasingly um, common, and it really everybody criticized TV ratings. Nobody seems to be criticizing, you know, how uh, most email clicks, uh, most clicked on, et cetera, et cetera. Here's another way to describe it: it's crowdsource editing. Yeah. Okay, and I, I tell you, does everybody know what crowdsourcing? You know what I mean by crowdsourcing? Where you know you're just so, sort of seeing where a majority of the folks, oh, this is the most popular story. And say, there are. Every producer at NBC News, of all our major news shows, and it's at every network, so I'm not just adding NBC News, we always want to know, oh, what's the most popular story right now on the website? What's the most popular story over the New York Times? Because there's this need, well, you want to sort of, if I, that's what I mean by crowdsource editing, and it becomes, well, everybody's talking about it, so we ought to cover it if everybody's talking about it. Why? Because at the end of the day, we're a business, we're a business of ratings, that's what it is. So now, the internet is even more so, it's worse than television when it comes to the reliance on ratings and, and getting paid by the click, getting paid by the page view and all that. And that in itself is, is a, again, this is sort of the, it, it, obviously it's important to find out, you know, what is getting traction and what isn't, but if we only did stuff based on what's getting traction, we all know how quickly we narrow it. And, and the other consequence also is that if you're getting paid by the hit and the click, the more prurient or the or the more gossipy or the more wild, of course, gets a lot of attention. So you've got the sort of 
you've got the whole phenomenon of Kardashians and TMZ and all the tabloid kind of journalism now bleeding into politics. And I thought it was very interesting when Anthony Weiner first got caught uh, last year uh, doing these tweets that he did to young women. At, at first, Nancy Pelosi and the leaders of Congress in Washington were kind of coasting, letting it go by. But then he just gobbled up all of the news, all of the news feed. That's all anybody was writing about, all anybody was talking about, and she told him he had to go because they had other issues to discuss and he was taking up too much space. But I see that, that um, if you look at the way politics is covered now, it's really much more covered in terms of gossip and, um, and private life. And the other consequence I was thinking of is I was looking at the coverage of the NSA um, issue in the last couple of days. What do you see? Do you know what Barack Obama's new transparency is about the National Security Agency? Well, if you were looking at, at, at most of the evening news shows, all you see are man on the street yeses or noes about should we have the NSA listening to us or shouldn't we? Nobody's telling us how is this very complex um, issue being determined because everything is all about up and down, up and down, vote for, it's, it's, vote Look, it's, we, we know it's rubbernecking, it's car wreck journalism, right? Okay, we'll all, everybody in this room will stare at a car wreck. Trash by it, right? Every one of you will. No matter how, how minded we want to claim we are, we'll all look at it and then we'll be like, well, that's that's what's going on, in, in, you know, it, the the game of the internet is clicks, and so every print news organization is is given. And, and look, this is it's even infecting the New York Times. I said it's even infecting the Wall Street Journal. Because at the end of the day, they have to they have to deliver. You know, they have to find this revenue stream online, and and so it is. It's 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 dumbing things down. We know that it's sort of forcing more reporters to just pursue a sort of more narrow line, so it's, what's the downside, right? We're losing investigative journalism. We're not covering the new, sort of, what's the new story no one knows about? Because we're, we're not focused, we're not worried about that. Instead, we're, we're kind of like, no, 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 keep covering what people will click on. And, and another it's a little interesting, depressing. well, there are some upsides, we have to say we that, right? So okay. We're not done but, <laughs> We got a couple more downsides. But, um, but the thing is, is that news is becoming increasingly global. And so just at the time that, um, that news organizations are cutting out reporters and not sending them abroad and really closing down bureaus and everything, you have to hear Square just blowing up. And what are you really, or, or even to a certain extent, the Boston bombings, you, what are you relying on? You're relying on tweets. You're relying on raw, unedited, um, coverage, quote, from, quote, citizen journalists. And part of crowdsourcing is, is that if you get enough tweets telling you essentially the same thing or showing you same pictures, that now, that now is okay to report. But it's extremely difficult to report more complex stories. Let's just take the example of the Supreme Court decisions. There have been a number of huge mistakes about Supreme Court decisions. I mean, I think, uh, CNN got the healthcare uh, decision wrong, um, and and now what they have, I know NBC, they've got they've got young interns who run fast, who are in the it, are, are in the chambers to grab to grab the decision as quickly as they can and race it out to their reporters. But you got to go through a 50 or 100 page decision, and you're supposed to get on the air in 30 seconds and tell the American public what it says. That's that's the kind of pressure that traditional news organizations are under now. And there are many, many more mistakes being made. But if you talk to the younger people who are the anonymous or some of these big news outfits, they don't care. They think, they think that traditional news organizations are bureaucratic and slow and filtered. And they'd much rather just throw it all up against the wall with whatever anybody says is going on, and they think that over the course of time it will probably correct itself, or you just use it as, as I said before, to opine. Well, and this is the, this is the pressure that us in big media are under, right? We're, we're, up, we're up against two big pressures. Number one, you have 
the BuzzFeed education, TMZ education, political education, whatever you want to call it. Uh, TMZ is really bad, right? They actually buy sources. They actually pay. Why did they have Michael Jackson's death first? Because they had a guy on payroll. They had one of the EMTs on payroll. How does a traditional news organization, you know, if NBC, ABC, or CBS did that, um, you know, it would be bad press for, for a month. People would be fired. Okay, TNZ do does it. it. They do it. They do it. We license way. photos. They no, 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 no. We license photos. photos. Yeah. Come on. Okay. Okay. No, come on. We don't pay. We just license their life. Of course. Um, but but the thing is, so you're coming under pressure. So guess what we do now? We do things like that. We license their photo album so that that's a way we pay for their travel to some place so we can do certain things. But the other um, the other interesting thing that's happened that on one hand is very accepted by one generation of news consumers. On the other hand, has hurt the credibility of all mainstream news organizations is this idea of open source reporting. So for instance, if, if uh, back in the day, and we still a little more operate this way at NBC versus everybody else, but if you have two conflicting sources, you wouldn't report anything. Now, if you have two conflicting sources, you report them both. I have one source telling me X, and I have one source telling me Y. I'm working to confirm and figure out which is right. Because the idea is what? Well, just you have to get throw it out there first. Right. And that way, if you're accidentally first, right, you get the quote glorification of being first. But you throw it out there, sometimes it's a way a journalist might do it because they're thinking, well, I'll get my second source this way, or I'll get somebody to confirm which one is wrong, which one is right. And again, Twitter has sort of become the home of this. I think I, you know, it did real damage to real individuals during the Boston bombing, right? We crowdsourced uh, suspect. a suspect that turned out to be wrong, and, the, and these two, two kids end up on the front page of the New York Post saying they're looking for these two guys, and it wasn't those two guys. Now, the New York Post was wrong. They weren't the only ones who were wrong. Everybody was dealing with this. They had a law enforcement tip. We all had law enforcement tip. Most news organizations, though, only had one source. Nobody was confirming it. Everybody knows the danger of Richard Jewell. NBC got sued for it. NBC paid a lot of money over Richard Jewell. You remember him in the 1996 uh, Olympic, Olympic bomb. In Atlanta. So we're a little more careful because we learned the hard way. But other news organizations didn't. But what's a little troubling is that, number one, it's accepted in Twitter land that this is the way you do it by one generation. But what does it end up doing? It hurts the credibility of when somebody, it hurts the credibility of all these organizations, which is then feeding this decline in trust in media. So it's a but, sort of a spiral that's, that's but, a little bit frustrating to get a hold of. The trust of these organizations, when they're really under the gun for a huge story, like the Boston bombing story, they just do stuff on Skype, you know, for people who are in the neighborhood. Or, or they, you know, they just rely on stuff that they never would have relied on. And then they just, but they feel the urge that they've got to go or else they're going to be left behind. And, and sometimes they're okay. I know, for example, at ESPN, um, one of the executives there told me they get scooped a lot because they make their reporters, for the most part, who hear things via tweets, go through the news desk first. And that really angers their reporters, you know, because somehow there has to be a filter. But other people don't do that at all. Now, should we go to the other sides or not? Well, I, I, I would go to one, one other unintended consequence of this in the, in the world that I deal with, which is politics. Um, and that we, we didn't get to. And then we'll go to, there are some positive, we swear. Um, but it's the, so we're talking about all of this sort of rush to sort of get a click, rush to sort of have a salacious thing. It is, I think, made it very hard to get politicians to talk. It's harder than ever for them to feel comfortable being candid, even in a moment in a campaign. Look, Mitt Romney learned the hard way. You can't even be candid at a fundraiser. And, and so did Barack Obama about the two comfort right. with Bibles and their guns in, in 2008. And these aren't new scoops. You know, people will sit there and say, well, those are scoops. And you people in the mainstream media miss a big story. No, we played by the rules. We were, didn't go into a private event. Um, I'm, not, I'm not saying it, we, you learn a little something, but now, what's the unintended consequence going to be? We're never going to know what these people think. Access is so much more controlled. Than and they're going to control even more, and they're going to make it, we'll, we're going to have a harder time getting to know these people, we're going to have a harder time, you're going to have a harder time getting to know these people, and, and, you know, there's this, 
it, it, I think it's going to lead to even fewer good people wanting to run because they're afraid of like one bad moment is going to ruin their reputation for good. And it's a, it, it, it's sort of, I mean, we've really cheapened political reporting right now a little bit to the point where I think it, it is going to, it's going to scar, you know, it's, it's, it's feeding the other problems that we're going to get to a minute in politics, but it's feeding those same problems. Okay, because our time, I, I, I'm the time, time keeper. Okay. So we have a couple of things that we think are positive, right? Okay. I think uh, I think that one of the things that's interesting about the new media is that is that it is being used all over the world. I mean, people who never had access to the same kind of reporting and uh, or, or were able to report or anything have cell phones now and they have computers. And so there's a true globalization going on where people can participate in, in stories and, and be part of a story. In a, in, and it also creates far more interest in global issues than previously. So I think that the kids who are in college now, who are growing up now, generally speaking, I think are much less isolationist than we were uh, when we were growing up. And I do think it's healthy that there is much more interest on in global events and global sales because you cannot ignore them because because um, they're just being thrown at us from all different points of view in all different places. I think that that is positive. I also think that if we go back to our original thing about what's Jeff Bezos going to do with the Washington Post, if you can really think about what. Um, what can you, what can the paper give you that you might not get other places? And I'm physically talking about, I don't know if the actual paper is still going to survive. I think it might survive, at, I mean, a version of a newspaper, whether it be the New York Times or the Washington Post, probably in several years. I think it might be a very, very expensive thing for the elite, like a, an expensive magazine to buy on a daily basis, perhaps, and everybody else is going to get everything else. Off of screens. Yes. New York Times already five dollars an issue. Yeah, exactly. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. But but I think that one of the things is probably if there's still news organizations out there willing to pay for it, the kind of deep reporting that I do, the kind of long form journalism that I do, people still want to read stories about other people. They still want to they want to hear narratives. They get interested in how people behave and what happens. And I do think that there. This is what they kind of have to grapple with now to try to understand long-form journalism, I think, has a better chance of surviving than lots of little bits and pieces that used to make up your daily newspaper, because those little bits and pieces can all be thrown onto the internet and they come and go so fast. So those are two things I think are possible. Basically, Maureen has jobs here. <laughs> the monthly magazine, no, it's true, the monthly magazine feels like it has new relevance in a way I think 15 years ago we were all worried the monthly magazine was going to die and everything was moving to weekly and daily. Now it turns out the weekly's dead, the dailies are dying, it's hourly and monthly that seem to be of what's, of what's relevant um, and all that. So I'm going to we'll go quickly to... Yeah, I want to ask you about politics because I mean, it's crazy to have Chuck just opine about journalism when we have so much insight. I love being a media critic. Oh, okay, well, never allowed but, okay, I've got three quick questions for you then about politics. Okay, one is 2008, the man from hope, Barack Obama, okay? We thought that he was going to be a transformational president and make things so different. He, he stirred up so many passions in so many people and now we're wondering what his legacy is going to be. What do you think? Hillary Clinton had that great line, remember, about May of 2008? Oh, he gives a speech, and the skies are going to part, and the seas will part. Remember, she got real sarcastic toward the end of the primary campaign. And now there are people that are Obama supporters that are like quoting her. It's very interesting. Um, look, I think in all honesty, Obama's legacy is going to get decided in the next three months, uh, in, in many ways. All right, we've got, he's got three months. Second terms are notorious, or they're never four years. Uh, Nixon's actually wasn't four years. <laughs> uh, Reagan's ended uh, somewhere during uh, the War, secretary hiding papers in her pants, right? Uh, Bill Clinton's ended unceremoniously after about a year. Uh, George W. Bush's ended, it was this month, in 2005, that his second term essentially came to an end. 
I say this, obviously, you know, you become, you become a lame duck in some form or another, and the question is when. The question is when is Barack Obama, when is his time up? They know their time, time is short. Um, this has already been pretty much as bad of a year as they thought they could have. Now, as bad as it looks, they're not the Republicans, right? That's, that's always sort of, that's how the White House makes them feel, them feel good. But we're not them. They're, the, they're actually eating their young uh, and their old and each other. Um, but if he's going to sign a big, if he's going to have any major legislation, the only shot he's got is the big immigration. Um, then if he doesn't get it, then really it's all about what? Implementing health care, hope that goes. And then maybe his other legacy could be, be some Democrat winning his third term at that point, or, uh, or the Republican Party imploding and Democrats winning, winning back control uh, of the House in some, in some uh, unrealistic scenario. I'm not saying it's not possible, anything. but the point is, the next three months, we've got the budget fight, debt ceiling, immigration, and the, and the launch of, of implementing health care. Uh, how that goes in these three months will determine, you know, is Barack Obama's legacy going to be the first African-American president that found a way to get reelected to transform the way you campaign? Or is he going to have a legacy that transforms the government, that transforms Washington? He already is struggling with the one big promise he thought he was going to make, which is changing sort of Washington, changing the politics of Washington. And that's my question. Are and, we going to continue the gridlock for the foreseeable future? And that's sort of, I think, you know, he ran against the 16 years of Clinton Bush, right? That was what turned the page meant. Turn the page meant what? Running against both Clinton and Bush. And and sort of the idea of always a Clinton, always a Bush. And now there's a group, there's a, you know, you talk to some Obama insiders and they sit there and, they, and I say, well, I said, so the next person is going to be running and it's, they're going to say, and there was 24 years of polarization and 24 years of Washington gridlock. Began with Clinton, then to Bush, then to you, you know, then to Obama. And, and that's not the legacy he wanted. And there's a, there's a certain frustration with, with the president that you see. And the question is, how is he going to act himself out? There's all sorts of theories that he faces. Obama, is he just somebody that doesn't like politics? That's part of my theory a little bit. The guy that doesn't, and I say this, this is a very, to me, it's a very rational way to think, right? Not liking politics, not liking back slapping. Unless you're trying to get elected. Well, unless you're, but, you know, there's a part of it, the Washington parlor game is not something he enjoys. Again, a lot of us here don't like it. You know, there's something that's, that's a perfectly rational thought. Don't be president of the United States, though. Right? You gotta, this is, un, this is an unfortunate part of the job. Bill Clinton obviously loved that part of the job. Okay? Barack Obama doesn't love that part of the job. And by the way, neither does Hillary Clinton that much, does she? No, she doesn't. Now, there's, a, there's an alternative theory here, which is maybe Washington's not governable. And, it's a, there's a, and that, I think that that is an answer we don't know. Right? I think that the fairest way to assess Obama right now on this whole, when you say this whole quote, is he's certainly a victim of extraordinary circumstance of a polarization that we have not seen, of a, of a, a Republican Party split in two between sort of a governing wing and a non-governing wing. You know, you see it, right? You have, you have about half of the Senate, Republicans in the Senate. They are there, they're, I call them legislative conservatives. And then there's a good half, the sort of the Libertarian Tea Party wing, that is about, hey, we gotta shrink government, and maybe the best way to shrink it is to stop it. Is to let it sort of come to a standstill. Inertia is not such a bad thing. So what if we have these standoffs? The one thing that's happening is what? Government's not getting bigger. And that they see that as a victory. Remember, Boehner said it. Boehner, when he said, I don't want to be judged by how many bills I pass. I want to be judged by how many bills I repeal or how many bills I don't pass. And that's true. that was not being snarky or this is sort of this is this. No, it's changing the paradigm. That's right. And this is sort of where half of the Republican Party is. The other half is a legislative Republican Party. It's in a different place. Now we're gonna they're on a collision course. You know, the, the way it's playing out lately, right, it's Chris Christie versus Rand Paul. Chris Christie representing the legislative businessman wing of the party, Rand Paul representing the Libertarian Tea Party wing. And it does feel like we're headed that this is 64. This is Goldwater Rock. That this is these two wings are going to collide. I don't know if it's Christie and Paul right now. I would have a word of warning to you. We're, we're in the middle of this. 
At this point in time, in 2005, the co-front runner for the Republicans, uh, for the presidential race in 2008, three years in advance where we are now, was George Allen. Okay, so just, all right, and Hillary Clinton was this insurmountable front runner that nobody was going to stop from winning the nomination, and Barack Obama was nine months into his Senate career telling everybody, no, 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 I'm not running for president. You know, maybe I'll run for, they were actually working on Barack Obama for governor 2010. Okay, the point is, so we don't, we, the, even the whole Hillary handicap that we can all just sort of take away. Okay, so we can take a breath and open it up for Q and A's. Okay, does anybody have any questions? No, and, and this goes to the part where you say what's ungovernable. Okay, everybody hear the question. I'll, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Yeah. Okay. The question was, in this media climate, could LBJ pass the Civil Rights Act as sort of the way we cover how, what is the policy implication, how we do that? Like, because this is where I would argue that this is where you would say Obama's a victim of circumstance in general. Like, that any president would be in this place, which is we now have a political media based in Washington that covers process so incrementally. Right. You can't breathe without it having been reported. So, for instance, how did Obama get his health care bill passed in the Senate? He got it because he had to, you know, he had to sweeten the deal a little bit to get Ben Nelson in Nebraska, had to sweeten the deal a little bit to get Mary Landrieu in Louisiana. That was how you practice politics in the 60s, 70s. Frankly, that's how you practice politics since we started in Athens. Okay? Um, you can't tell me those guys weren't buying each other off in some form or another. Uh, but now, we expose it. And instead of it becoming, Ben Nelson got a little more for Nebraska in this Medicaid deal, it became the Cornhusker kickback. Or in Louisiana, it was, the, they called it the Louisiana Purchase. So Again, she just got an extra deal for Louisiana. That's no longer, they no longer rewarded in our political climate. Number one is, is sort of this idea of getting something in return, this sort of deal making. And the constant coverage of it then it sort of consumes the actual bill itself, and then so I guess my answer is I don't know. I, mean, I had a I had a, an Obama advisor joke to me, and he was, he said you know under these circumstances there'd still be slavery. Lincoln wouldn't have gotten the Thirteenth Amendment. And that's because the old adage is you never want to see how legislation is you know made sausages or legislation is made. Well now you can't help but see how it's trying to be made. You and just, it's a great clip. It's a great headline. There's your depressing answer. <laughs> so there be a vote in the House on immigration? Will there be a vote in the House on immigration? I think there will be a series of votes. I do believe this. I think that, that you know, um, Paul Ryan is the sort of the House Republican guy that's trying to get this over the finish line. Um, he's not running for president. He's going to keep flirting with it, but I don't believe he truly has that ambition in him. I think he. I've spent a lot of time with him talking about this issue. I think he's pretty genuine about it, the same way Rubio was in the Senate. So I think he's going to use his capital to push this. I think that is just enough to force this enough votes. And especially if the House Republicans are going to hand the conservatives the, the debt ceiling fight, let them dictate the budget fight. They're going to do some, they're going to basically, I, my theory is, they're basically going to say, no, 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 you got to let us do it. We're going to let you. Take us off the cliff on these two issues. You got to let us fix immigration while we have a shot.
I mean, this is a, no, this is becoming a real issue. So, so this is this is one of my pet peeves of sort of the way we've divided the media for a while. There was a time where politicians had to go through only three or four places to prove your prove your mind or to get an idea out there. Uh, and, and Tim and Barry was sort of holding this up in many ways all on his own. Uh, whether it was coincidental or whether it, it happened after Tim died, you've seen more politicians now. They can just pick and choose. We can't get certain people to come on our network because they're afraid of a challenging interview. I cannot get certain people to come on because they're, you know, you know whether, whether it's Rand Paul, whether it's Chris Christie, whether it's Ted Cruz, and they don't have to in their minds. They don't have to go and meet no, the press. And they and they, they can just go on Fox. And they tweet and tweet and tweet and, and use social media to their own advantage. And Democrats, by the way, Do the they don't necessarily go on Fox. They feel like, well, I'll just go to the safe haven and go on, and, and go on a, a show on Amazon. And that's another unintended consequence that we did not discuss, and that is that when you, when you have this kind of polarization and you've got such a choice of things to view, people who really think that they're being conscientious and really want to figure something out, they tend to go to the place that they trust more, and then they actually end up seeing, I mean, then they're at, they're, if you go to Fox or you go to MSNBC and that's all you see, it tends to form you in a way that's much less diverse than it would have been if there were three news um, broadcasts every night that where somebody was filtering it for you and making you, you know, eat your spinach and this listening is, to both sides. This is what's frustrating. We live in an era of so much information. It's all there. I can't tell you I watch people have to make Twitter feeds that are ideologically imbalanced. And I'm sitting there going, you, you have this ability to get it, to see the whole picture, and you choose not to do it. You have this ability to see that whole picture on television, you see it on the internet, and people aren't doing it, right? We have this, it's, and, and my fear, so for instance, and, and the problem is news organizations mm -hmm. are now discovering this. So I have this great fear, the way I read, I, I, um, yeah, the way I read the New York Times app. I'm, I don't get the day, I don't get the newspaper every day, just don't, at, at home. I, I'm, I'm all apps, all, all in my digital. But I'm fearing that the New York Times is gonna discover the, look at the sections that I look at most, and then they're gonna personalize it, where I only see that come up on my homepage. I don't even ask for it. And this is happening in a lot of news organizations. I didn't even ask them to diversify, to, 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 to make, to not diversify my news diet. They're doing, and I want a diverse news diet. I happen to, I proactively, I do look at who I, I follow on Twitter, and I'm all over the map. I wanna know what, I wanna, I follow people that are, are gonna live tweet everything Rush Limbaugh says on a given day, and live tweet everything Rachel Maddow says on a given day. I wanna see all of it. I wanna know the entire conversation that's taking place in politics in the digital world. And I'm, but too many news organizations think that we all want this personalization and this, in this non-diversification. No, but I think that comes a lot from just they want to sell ads. Come on. No, that's right. No, it's a business it's decision. Ads. I know why it is. Yeah. It's just for business. Right. But this is this is one of the unintended consequences. Let's go. Let's go. Yes, sir. So what do we teach journalists? You know, that's a really good question. Um, I, I don't know because I haven't been to journalism school for a while, but I think that's an excellent question. And I know that, uh, I know just when I observe at Berkeley, for example, everybody has to obviously learn all kinds of digital stuff, but they know it anyway. But I see that they tend, some places tend to want to specialize in one thing or another, and I think they send them, sometimes the only time they ever get sent out to really report real stuff is in journalism school now. No, I, it's funny, I, so I was asked to, there was a group of journalism professors and association that had a summer meeting in D.C. and they asked me to speak on new media and the sort of ethics of new media. And I said, well, I'm here to try to, actually I was hoping you would tell me what they are. And I said this, and they look, these were, it was a very, these were really good journalism professors from all of the major, Syracuse, Missouri, Northwest, but this was, and this is a real, you know, what are we teaching? How do we teach it? Uh, I, I think, the idea that you specialize is a mistake. We've got to redo that. I don't think that. When you specialize in the medium. Well, they do now, teach crowdsourcing. Right. They teach I, those things. I do believe that journalism school, 
I think that they're, I want a doctor reporting my health things. I want an astronaut reporting my space things. That's me. Um, I say that. I, I do think the, that the, 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 a positive trend in journalism should be the expertization in certain fields. That doesn't mean you, you don't have some of this. And I think that in somehow journalism school needs to modernize itself in some way to, to sort of help. Okay, you're going to be general. You're going to be you know, obviously there's certain ethics you learn. There's certain, uh, but uh, to me that that's all learned in here. Then the question is, okay, what are you going to what are you going to do with it? How are you going to what are you going to specialize in? Or if you specialize this, how do you learn? You know, you're you're going to journalism school school to get the tools. You, I think journalism school specializes a lot a lot more now in in trying to teach how you read big data. That's one of the biggest trends right now. Um, how do you collate the numbers? And, and um, writing, believe it or not, is also still taught and um, has it some is. validity. Is anybody copy out of the newspaper? <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, well, my bet in my life is spelling the country of Columbia wrong. It, it, even in the, it, it was so amazing. The other day in the Wall Street Journal, they had C O L O M B I A, which is correct in the lead, and then it was spelled C O L U M B I A, the rest of the story. And I thought, this is the Wall Street Journal, you know? So you're right about that. Do you, do you see Edward Snowden as a whistleblower or a criminal who should be prosecuted and by extension, Glenn Greenwald as well? And do you feel that the reforms that uh, Obama has proposed as a victory or vindication for Snowden? Well, well look, I, I just... I, the question was about is that yeah, so a whistleblower or um, and and are the and and you feel the same way about Greenwald or do you think he should be prosecuted and Greenwald as well. Greenwald as well and what are the do you think the reforms are enough? Is that what you said? Are the reforms a victory? For a Snowden? victory to Snowden. Or vindication. Uh, look, it's I, the same. That's the exact question I asked the president on Friday. Well, you know, you made these reforms. None of the, does any of this happen? Isn't he a whistleblower? Yeah. And he also, the president then had used in his opening statement saying people that disagree with these are patriots. And then I threw in and said, well, it's a patriot, which then ended up getting what we got. Um, which was, please tell us. That he said, no, he's not a patriot. And I, look, I look at it, I, I'm a, at the end of the day, I'm a journalist, and I think you, when you're, when you, when somebody sparks a new political debate that forces people to rethink some things, how is he not a whistleblower in some form or another? Now, uh, you sit there, did he steal data? Yeah. To me, you've got to sort of, the, 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 the large man. idea, he's a whistleblower. Hey, did you know that, and you know what, the country didn't know the NSA was doing some of these things. Um, obviously, he broke some laws to do this. He stole that. Uh, and you also and have people that are, quote, not our friends going off all this stuff. There's something that's a little uncut, right? You sit there and you're like, geez, you're hanging out with the Chinese, you're hanging out with the Russians, what all, but, but needless to say, the fact of the matter is the President of the United States has been uh, forced to change. Has been forced to at least rhetorically change. I don't know if some of these reforms are gonna happen, okay? I happen to think they're going to, that's why he did what he did. Because if he didn't, the whole NSD, the, it was a real possibility that the NSA would see at least a temporary freeze in funding for this program. And there they was, had no choice but to react. So the fact of the matter is, about that, you know, in Congress. the fact of the matter is, it doesn't, Edward Snowden forced this. That's the definition of a whistleblower in my mind. And you know, I, I, again, it's all very complicated, and I think that the country is, on this whole security and privacy thing, I think it's one of those, in the grand scheme of things, you think one thing, and to stop a terrorist attack, you think another. And to me, that's a perfectly rational thought to have. You, the idea that somehow, if you're thinking one way, you shouldn't think of the other is also like, no, no, no. It's okay to think, basically, that both items are correct, that I want, okay, I'm not doing anything wrong, I guess I'm okay with them looking at it. Jeez, I really don't want them looking at it. You know what I mean? That's a, it, it seems counterintuitive, but I think it's a perfectly rational way for, for Americans. You know, we lost a, a dear colleague, John Palmer, um, who died 
who was a long time NBC news anchor and a friend of both of ours in, in Washington. And, we, and when you really think about how much everything has changed, John Palmer's great scoop in life was as a White House reporter, a correspondent for NBC, he was driving down Pennsylvania Avenue one Sunday night and he saw a light on in the White House. And he thought, why is that light on on a Sunday night? Something must have happened. And that's how he got the scoop of his life, which was the failure of the Iran rescue of the American uh, hostages in 1980. Now, and Chuck and I were talking tonight, and, and there has been such a huge emphasis on anti-terrorism and, quote, protecting us against terrorism. There is no way any journalist can drive down Pennsylvania Avenue now, any day of the week. It is completely off limits. And all the stuff that's been done in the name of secrecy, there is more stuff that is classified now by, by mega, mega, mega mouse. No it, it has any business it being classified. That was the last great fight of Daniel Patrick Moynihan. He was very much against this over, over, over abundance of secrecy in classification. So I would agree with Chuck about the whistleblower because we have a very healthy debate. And one of the most interesting things if you really try to understand this NSA thing is they are parsing words. They have, if you say, are you listening? And they'll say no, because their definition of listening is different than what 99.9% .9 of us But are you reading? But are you, you know. Are and you so, word searching? Oh uh, yeah, and if you don't ask the question right, they can, and what was the guy, the head of the NSA, what was his great quote the other day? He goes, I was trying to be, I was trying to be, what was it? I was trying to be as less true, as much, what? No, what was it? He said dishonest. Yeah, less dishonest. I was as trying as to be less dishonest. Yeah. As less dishonest, yeah. Right, I mean, you're, so, but it all goes to this whole over secrecy business. And, and, and it means all it. in the name of being protected from terrorism, and I think it's swung way too far in one direction. And so you sort of need moments like this, and again, you may have broken the law on stolen data. I've got a whole problem with contractors having that kind of access. Like that's a whole other separate topic that we haven't pursued enough. But at the end of the day, it's sort of, you know, the pendulum, it just needs to happen over the a lot, right? You sort of have to have that uncomfortable moment to sort of refocus. I think our time's up. Let's get a couple more, right? We have five more minutes. <laughs> We're told. So two more questions. Okay. Go, oh, yes, sir. Tim didn't have to deal with Twitter. sometimes, no, X did not happen. We know this has gotten through, that this is in the ether, this is in the system. We know that millions of people think this is X. We know this is not true. But then they still don't believe you. Well, but the point oh, is... Obama was born in Kenya. No, but the point is... <laughs> but his mom was... But Ted Cruz says his mom was an American citizen, so he can run for president. Ted Cruz was born in Canada and now says he can run for president. Uh -huh. um, and it's okay. But my point is, is that I think we're, we are getting to a point where somebody, you know, there's Snopes, it's real popular on the internet, right, to sort of disprove internet theories that get out there. But I actually think that, that and granted, maybe we'd be chasing our tail and digging holes forever and never, but forget how buzz. I think news organizations might have to definitively say, X is not true. We know this is this, is this popular belief. It's not fact-checking. It's sort of, it's taking it a step further uh, and dedicating, you know, that is a civic 
if your civic duty is to report what's going on, and you know that something is, people think something's happening and it's not true, then, and then a news organization's civic duty is to what? Tell you the truth. So I think that, and again, this would be a different mission. Nobody, used to be news organizations, if something wasn't true, by not reporting it, you were able to say, well, we didn't report it. That was somebody else. No, you know what? You know it's out there. Your duty is to, to let people know it's not true. I think it's I, I'm a little, I think that's a big responsibility and takes on a whole, you know. It comes a lot of risk, but yeah. you know what, so does, so do yeah. also as they get out. So that's, I mean, that's well, I think, yeah. I agree. All right. One more. Last, oh. Maybe a bit of a second. What are your opinion of the allegation by some about the bias of the network news and the question is bias in, in journalism. So I'll, I'll do. Or you go first. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you. I thought the whole night is explaining that there's thousands of biases all around us all the time. I, I honestly um, think that that um, the problem is more not that, that there's so much bias, but that there's so much pressure to to stay competitive and be first. And I think that's a much worse. Uh, a danger than, than being biased. I, I don't know. I mean, I've worked for Newsweek. I've worked for different magazines. I haven't worked. I've contributed, you know, to the New York Times and the Washington Post. We always have the same. Uh, we always, up till now, have had to operate with getting much more than one source. And um, I will admit there's certain biases. I think that Michael Jackson is a pedophile. Okay, and I think I've talked to enough people and I did five investigative pieces over 12 years. I think I know enough to say that. Is that biased? Am I supposed to say some people, I, I didn't hear what his lawyer told me, he just liked to have sleepovers with little boys. Well, here's what I always say. I, I, I do a, I do this. We're all born with original bias. And I say this, you know, we're in a church, sort of, right? Um, I love the Unitarian. Um, what I mean by this is, I think more, there is more bias is geographic and cultural than it is ideological. So for instance, I think um, the fact that most news organizations are based in the Acela Corridor is a form of bias. And the Acela Corridor, by the way, if you don't know what that, I mean by that, the sort of the New York to DC nexus and the Acela, you know, the, the, obviously the train is sort of a little bit. It does go up to Boston. <laughs> Who's writing that long? Come on. Not for me, so. Um, but I think that, so for instance, on the issue of guns, it's perfectly rational to me that Michael Bloomberg doesn't want a lot of people in New York City to have guns. My uncle that lives in the Northwest Arkansas is a logger who, where it takes 30 minutes for, um, 30 minutes for a first responder to show up. He was shot years ago by some crazy guy, and it took 30 minutes for somebody to show up. And after that, he said, I'm, gonna, I'm better on a shotgun, survivor. It's perfectly rational for me that people that live in rural America are thinking, you know what? I have a right to bear arms, and I have a right to, have an arm, uh, to be armed there. But if you live in New York City, you live in a major city, you just, you're going to have a, what I call an environmental bias on an issue like that, which then turns into a cultural bias, which then turns into this ideological, then it, and then it becomes this form of ideological this, this idea that there's ideological bias on it. My great concern now is that, is what we talked about earlier, which is we are getting back to advocacy journalism as an accepted form of journalism. And what I mean by that is that you know, somebody who's got a point of view, Glenn Greenwald is an advocacy journalist. He is a journalist, but he only pursues stories that fit his point of view. Okay, that he's a privacy athlete, he's a privacy, this is his obsession, privacy. He is not going to pursue a story he may he's disagree with me. What he right. wants to I don't think promote. he's going to pursue a story that's not going to go as what he's promoting. That doesn't mean he's not a good journalist on this issue, right? And that he doesn't have passion about all this. But it also means it's an incomplete picture, and that is a form of bias reporting. So this whole move to advocacy journalism does sort of concern me because you're, you're you know, what is the reporter blinding himself or herself from in doing that? And obviously now we where people are, are sort of digesting, you know. Look, at the end of the day, it's the consumers that are, 
that are as much of the problem here as the media. If consumers would uh, consume a diverse, you know, read, I always tell people, can you at least read both the Wall Street Journal editorial page and the New York Times editorial page? You know, can you, you know, follow, uh, I always say, you know, follow both Marcos of Daily Coast and Eric Erickson of Red State, if you want to know what's going on in the world, you know, try to at least, you know, diversify how you're consuming some media uh, on that form. But largely, most of the, most of the actual, you know, the, the, most of the bias, whether it's sort of framed in a biased way, most of the time they're, they're not. And the only times that I feel like they, they happen more often than not, it's usually this geographical and sometimes socioeconomic, where it's more of we, if, if NBC News were headquartered in Wichita, my God, we would cover a lot more stories about the, about we issues, okay? Uh, rather than about what's going on with Chris Christie's lap band surgery. Okay, and that, you know, so. And you know, East Coast weather. And a lot of East Coast weather. Yeah, it snows all the time in Minnesota. And guess what? If the, if you know, if, again, if it's going to snow somewhere in the East Coast, we're we'll leaving the next week. So that, I actually think that that does more to sort of create the mythology of bias. And I, and I say it's, there's some truth, but on some of this political stuff, it's not as true as one, as a couple of networks would like people to believe that it is, because it's good for their bottom line. And there's so much out there now that it, it, it you know, it's if you have to, yeah, it is, really, you know, because there's too much out there to be able to consume to have to worry about whether one, I mean, I don't, I don't believe in it being biased, but I'm just saying, you can go find out if you really want to, I hope. All right, that's it for us. That's it.